Turns out Elon Musk and SpaceX benefited from the most recent explosion of Booster 7 on the launch pad. After that unexpected incident, SpaceX appears to be a bit more confident and decided to attempt to recover the first super heavy booster that launches with a giant mechanized launch tower nicknamed Mechazilla. Just wow! But why did Musk make such a daring, abrupt plan change? Let's find out today in our episode of Alpha Tech Channel. The fireball last week that sent SpaceX Super Heavy Booster back to the factory with a heaping serving of luck, Booster 7 made it through the event mostly intact. By the time Super Heavy was removed from the launch mount the next day, July 14th, it became clear the situation wasn't quite as optimal. Instead, Booster 7's aft engine section was clearly damaged, with some of the dozens of thermal protection panels enclosing 33 Raptor engines apparently torn off or knocked askew by the July 11th blast. Given the tight fit and relatively heavy-duty nature of some of those panels, deformation could easily damage some of the more sensitive plumbing and components of the Raptor engines. The day prior, team spent hours tearing out unexpectedly fragile components of Booster 7's hidden aft heat shielding and even removed and replaced one of its Raptors in situ. More likely than not, all Raptor engines with minor damage can be repaired and reused on a future booster. Importantly, the explosion gave SpaceX invaluable data that can be used to improve the durability and performance of Raptor and Super Heavy's heat shield. Nonetheless, a methodical inspection of Booster 7's aft end could easily take a week or two. If more chronic damage is discovered or the whole aft heat shield or large number of Raptors need to be removed and replaced, the hiatus could grow to a month or longer. Following Booster 7's July 15th return to the Starbase factory, about half of the Raptors on B-7 have been scrapped so far, kicking off a phase that will hopefully be heavy on encouraging inspection results and light on substantial repair. If it turns out that the Super Heavy prototype is mostly in great shape after such a violent anomaly, it would bode well for the rocket's durability during future ground and flight testing. If it did not fare well, SpaceX may need to seriously reconsider whether Booster 7 is a fit to support Starship's orbital launch debut or even proceed into static fire testing. Actually, this is the reason why Musk confidently changed the Super Heavy prototype's first orbital flight path as a last-minute abort. An updated document submitted by SpaceX to the U.S. Federal Communications Commission FCC, has revealed details about the company's plan for the first Starship booster catch attempt. The document follows a different batch submitted by SpaceX in June 2021 when the company detailed its plans for the Starship orbital launch debut as background while requesting permission from the FCC to use Starlink dishes for in-flight telemetry. A month earlier, a different request focused on more standard telemetry antennas that had already revealed that if the mission went perfectly, Starship would not fully reach orbit on its first attempted spaceflight. It also confirmed that SpaceX had no intention of recovering the upper stage or super heavy booster assigned to Starship's launch debut, a sort of implicit acknowledgement that success was then not expected on the first try. Twelve months later, SpaceX has submitted an updated review of Starship's orbital launch debut and a new request for permission to use multiple Starlink dishes on both stages. While most of the document is the same, a few particular details have changed about Super Heavy's role in the mission. This time around, SpaceX says that the Super Heavy booster will separate, perform a partial return, and land in the Gulf of Mexico or return to Starbase and be caught by the launch tower. Prior to this document, SpaceX's best-case plan for the Super Heavy booster to launch never strayed from a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico, potentially demonstrating it would be safe to attempt booster recovery on the next launch, all but guaranteeing that the first booster would be lost at sea. The FCC application is specific to the first orbital launch of Starship, so CEO Elon Musk must have this goal in mind for the booster's maiden voyage, and that's a big ask, as nothing like this has ever been attempted before. Sure, the company can land Falcon 9 booster stages like it's nobody's business, but the Starship booster is a horse of a different color. In addition to returning to Starbase, the 230-foot-tall or 70-meter booster would have to orient itself above the 400-foot-tall 122-meter structure. Clearly, the company has dramatically complicated the process of testing early Super Heavy and Starship recovery and thus reuse by fully removing traditional and predictable landing legs and designing its latest prototypes such that the only way they can be recovered is one piece with a giant mechanized launch tower nicknamed Mechazilla. And there's many ways this can fail. However, besides helpful data obtained after the B-7 explosion, 
Elon Musk has another secret weapon to help him make the decision, Starlink V2 satellites. In fact, SpaceX has submitted new FCC filings for Starlink communications during the Starship orbital test flight. Starlink would allow high data rate communication and remove telemetry blackouts during the re-entry of Starship. According to the updated application, multiple Starlink terminals will be fitted to each vehicle, both the booster and the upper stage, to ensure a clear view of the SpaceX satellite constellation through the Starship flight profile. The terminals will use the same antenna and communications electronics as SpaceX's previously authorized consumer terminals, but with a revised enclosure and mounting that is suitable for the mission profile. When fully operational, this massive constellation would provide high-speed internet to almost every part of the globe, including the most rural areas. But it's actually the satellite technology itself that proved to be very useful for the SpaceX catching system. Starlink dishes have a phased array antenna, which allows the signal to be directed towards a satellite without any moving parts. It uses destructive and constructive interference to steer the radio wave in the right direction. With more control over the direction of the signal and stronger resistance to the intense vibrations, these Starlink dishes seem to provide a more stable connection than the standard transmitters they were using before. The majority of these satellites currently orbit at an altitude of around 550 kilometers, and each one can cover an area of 950 kilometers. With most drone ship landings taking place around 600 kilometers offshore, a single satellite should be capable of receiving the signal and sending it down to the ground station. However, since each satellite moves across the sky very quickly, the Starlink dish on the ground will most likely have to switch between multiple different satellites as each one goes out of range. This should happen seamlessly just like your phone switching between data towers. The result is a perfectly stable video signal from the time the rocket enters the atmosphere all the way through to its being caught by Mechazilla. Falcon 9 is so successful to reuse, so Elon Musk definitely wants to do this with his darling Starship Super Heavy as quickly as possible. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode, and don't forget share your ideas in the comment section. Everyone's support is motivation for us to create more quality content. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.